Well, amen. Good morning. How are you? All right, there we go. Excited that you are here. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, and hopefully you brought this back or you picked one up on your way in the door. If you did not, uh, raise your hand. We'll have some ushers who will run around and be glad to uh, give you one of these. Uh, I had someone tap me on the shoulder on the way in and said, this is week three and I still brought it and I need credit for that. So good job. Absolutely. Keep taking notes. Keep bringing this back. We're in the middle of our sermon series titled Every Spiritual Blessing. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, Paul is outlining how you and I, in Christ Jesus, that God as the great mover, the one who initiated, the author, the one who created the plan, has picked you up and placed you in Christ Jesus to the praise of his glorious grace and the blessings that are bestowed on you as a child of God is that you have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Okay? And now we are walking through one by one, there are six that are listed there, how you and I have every spiritual blessing. Last week, we began with the fact that we have been chosen from the foundation of the world. And you left here and your head hurt. And that is a good thing. But this morning... We're going to be listening how the scripture says, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters. Okay, now many of you have been memorizing with me. I messed it up in the second service last week. Let's see if I can get it right this week. All right, here we go. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him from the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to, his good, uh, to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has, he has favored us in the beloved. Okay? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, how incredible it is that I can simply utter those words that you are our heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that all across this room and all across living rooms at home through the computer screen or however they are listening, that your Holy Spirit would allow us to hear your heart and to comprehend your magnificent love in a deeper, more true way this morning. Father, I know that there are hearts that are heavy. There are hearts that are filled with obstacles and minds that are filled with confusion. I pray that your spirit would break through, would knock down walls, and would penetrate hearts in a way that is absolutely magnificent. Also that we would know and understand you more. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Richard Nixon, the 37th president of the United States, is forever remembered in the shame as the only president to resign in the face of impending impeachment over the Watergate scandal. See, after two years of a public battle, it became apparent and known that the Senate had the two-thirds votes required for impeachment. And so before they could vote, Nixon resigned. Gerald Ford was uh, 
sworn in the next day, and within less than a month, Ford had issued Nixon an unconditional full pardon for any crimes that he may or may not have committed while he was the president of the United States. So there it was, a full, unconditional pardon. No court hearing, no charges to ever be brought against him. However, the stain of his legacy in the shame of the scandal caused Nixon to spend the rest of his life uh, in San Clemente, California, basically living as a recluse. Whereas most presidents would go and speak and tour the world and do all sorts of other things, Nixon essentially just hid in shame, permanently stained, although pardoned, permanently stained. Last week, we spoke about God choosing you from the foundation of the world, that you and I, if we are in Christ, stand before him holy and blameless, given a full, unconditional pardon, never to have any charges ever brought against us. Now, I opened with this illustration because I want you, I need you to realize that the declaration of you and I being completely made just, of you and I having the imputed righteousness clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, although the Scripture would never speak in this way as if you still carried shame, the truth of the matter is, is there is a difference between simply being declared righteous and being adopted into God's family. One is being justified before a judge never to have a charge brought against you, and the other is being brought into the arms of your heavenly Father. I remember the change that occurred when I first became a father. When I looked at this child, this magnificent son who is now mine, never before had I ever cared about 10 little toes until then. Never before had I combed through the house and looked for any sharp corners and spots or little choking hazards until then. Never before had I tasted baby food or played here comes the airplane while making motoring noises until then. Never before had I changed a stinky, rotten diaper until then. Oh, how a parent looks at a child. Oh, how a grandparent looks at a child child. If you and I could grasp this morning how your heavenly Father looks at you, everything would change. Last week, our minds were stretched with the truth that from eternity past, and, and you went as far as your mind could go. Today, although I will give you lots and lots of factual truths, my aim is to flood your heart with the incredible truths of in Christ, you are now an adopted son or daughter of the King. Now, before I go any further... I know that many of you in this room didn't have a great earthly father. And any time you hear the scriptures speak of father, you have a roadblock there. You think of your father. Can I just say I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Come to the father of the fatherless. Come to the one who knew you from eternity past. 
Come to the one who is the great life-giving Father. Do not compare the ocean because of a tiny cesspool. Come to your heavenly Father. Now listen to these next two verses that I'm going to read. If you are in Christ... I don't care how you feel. Listen to how the scripture speaks and what it says about you. Romans 8, 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Or Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has set forth his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. See, the main point I want you to notice about these two chief passages in the Scripture is not only does it call you a son or a daughter of God, but it purposely just opposes that to the idea of a slave. That you are not a slave, rather you are a child. You see, formerly you were a slave. You were born into the bondage of your sin. And a slave faces the cold nature of the letter of the law, rigid, the abrupt truth. He is, un, uh, he is guilty before an unsympathetic judge. He is whipped out of anger, punished to send a message out of fear. A slave is not welcome past certain boundaries within the house. A slave is told, you keep out. You cannot go here. You cannot go through that door. You cannot enter these portions of the house. These portions of the house are reserved for sons and daughters. You stay out there. You do your work. You just be productive. Stay out of the way. It's like when little orphan Annie first arrives at Oliver Warbuck's house when she is nothing but a publicity stunt. And he doesn't have time for her. She is annoying. She's making too much noise. She's always getting in the way. Just keep quiet and get over there. But the scripture says, you and I are no longer slaves. Rather, we are sons and daughters in the house coming to the Father. Chuck Yielding and his 14-year-old son, Aiden. Aiden has leukemia. And because of the coronavirus, he's only allowed one visitor who is his mama. So father set up in the parking lot, unable to go in there during the chemotherapy treatments and longing to comfort and to make his son laugh. He sat out in the parking lot with these goofy pants on and began to perform dance moves so that his son would come to the window and be cheered up and dance with him. I want you to see, I want you to understand the love of God. A father. You see, you and I are received as a father, as a father does his son. The freedom of a son. A son goes wherever he wants in his home. He comes and goes as he pleases. He gets food whenever he wants. He makes a mess. He does all the things that a son does. Why? Because he's at home. Because he has freedom. He is who he is. He's not afraid. And he approaches the Father within that freedom. This past fall, whenever I lost my father and I was walking through the grief process and still am, but there was a a crucial moment where the Holy Spirit 
in God's kindness, allowed me to put my finger on the particular issue that I was dealing with, with the loss of my dad. And here's what it was. My dad was the number one person in the entire world that I could just come to, just be myself. No questions asked, no strings attached, no put on airs, just come to my father. I had a good father. He was strong and confident. Let me put it like this. If, if I came and I asked you for money, there would be many people right here in this room who would be kind and gracious enough and you would help me out. But it would always be different versus when it's my own father. Because when it's my own dad, you see, he loved me, he trusted me. I could come to him at any moment and just come, just be myself. He was proud of me, and so I didn't have to do anything. No pretension, no nothing, just come. And the loss of that, it was suffocating at times. Until I realized that I have that exact same access, if not more, with my Heavenly Father. Amen. Just come. Just be yourself. When you are sad, come and find a father who is tender and compassionate. When you are joyful, come and find a father who will rejoice with you. Even when you are bored, come and find a, a father who is glad that you have chosen him. God forbid that the children of God should tremble like slaves. We have not received a spirit of fear. But we've received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out, Abba, Father. You see, what privileges do you and I have as adopted sons and daughters? Come, find a father who loves us. Who loves us. 1 John 3, 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called children of God. You see, love is a word that is used so often that it just bounces off your ears and you don't hear it, right? I love the cowboys. I love Mary's tacos. But please understand me that when the scripture uses, that God has the eyes of a father. He looks upon you the way a father does. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? Jesus tells that to let you know the father is waiting on the porch with his eyes looking and longing down the road. And he doesn't wait. He jumps up and he runs to embrace the son. When I help coach Eli's soccer team, 90% of the time I'm just watching my son. And when I watch Lily's ballet performances... Why is it that she alone is the star of the show? When Ian turned four, he came to us and he said, I'm ready to take my training wheels off the bike. I was like, well, you're a bit young, all right, uh, but okay. And so he was insistent upon it. So we took the training wheels off, and I padded that kid up, you know, with helmet, all sorts of, it's a wonder he could do anything. I was so ready. And then I gave him this talk, like, you're going to fall a bunch of times, and you're going to get hurt, but you're going to get back up, right? Well, here's the deal. He never fell once, okay, <laughs> except, except to get off the bike because it was so big that he had to topple over. So he rides that day, right? And at the end of that day, I remember he looks at me, and he says this. Daddy, are you proud of me? And my heart, of course, exploded in one sense, but in another sense, it just wanted to say, son, son, of course I'm proud of you, but I'm not proud of you because you rode a bike. I'm proud of you because of you. 
right? I'm happy that you rode a bike, but I don't care about that. I am proud of you. It is just you. You are the apple of my eye. You don't have to do anything to ever earn my affection or my attention. I just am proud of you. Zephaniah 3.17 says, God rejoices over you with shouts of joy. Think about that. God rejoices over you with shouts of joy. You. He looks at you and he knows you and you are the apple of his eye. You are the delight of his heart. Without having to do any song or dance or anything, he just rejoices over you. Come, find a father who knows you. He knows when you rise up. He knows when I sit down. He knows every hair I've lost on my head. That was a joke. (laughs) He knit you in your mother's womb. He knew you before time began. His thoughts towards you outnumber the sand on the seashore. But listen, there's so much more to knowing than just facts, right? Come to a father who understands you. He understands the way you tick. He understands the way you think. He knows a thought before it ever is. Lane has this incredible ability to understand Lily in a way that I don't don't know how they do it. It's, It's like they can just mind communicate Okay? They just get each other. She's a little mini her. Come, find a father who promises to provide for you. Matthew 6, Jesus told his, his, uh, his followers there, look at the birds of the field. Do, do they store up food in pantries? But your heavenly Father, he promises to provide for you. Are you not much more valuable than they? Look at the lilies and the flower of the field. Do you see how magnificently they are clothed? Will not your heavenly Father do that for you? Come to a Father who promises to protect you. Psalm 50 verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will rescue you. He is your sword. He is your shield. He is your tower of refuge. How many times has Satan asked to sift you like wheat and he has simply said no? Come find a father who disciplines and shapes you. Now I know most of us would rather this not be in this portion of gifts that we have from our heavenly father. We wish there weren't trials. And so you ask the question, why are there trials? God, why do you put me through difficult times? You have to understand every good father who loves his children disciplines them. Why? Well, because he loves them. You know, I I never thought I would say this and you probably know what I'm about to say. It's that when you're spanking them, you say, This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. But it's true. But it's true. You see, a father can see. A father is concerned about character development. He sees who the son or daughter needs to become. And he loves them enough to give them temporary pain immediate in the context in order for character development and delayed gratification in the long term. A father sees. Also, a father never disciplines out of anger or wrath, only out of love, only out of what is best for the child. Did you know that Romans 8.29 says that God is in the process of transforming you into the image of Jesus Christ? Now, can we all admit that that's going to take a few trials to get you there? 
It might be a bumpy process, but that is what God is doing. He lovingly has his hand and he guides you and he moves you forward and he never stops. There have been a handful of times in my life where, where, where the Lord through his Holy Spirit, has just spoken to me in, in powerful moments, okay? And one in particular, I had an awful day at work. I was working as an engineer, and it was just the worst, awful, awful day at work. But then on top of that, after getting chewed out by my boss and a lot of those things, I'm, I'm on my way home. You're stuck, you're stuck in traffic. But on top of that, it, it just seems like incident after incident where... You just feel like you're being picked on. You have people cutting off uh, in front of you. There's uh, someone stalled in your lane, all sorts of stuff. Just all these obstacles after obstacles after obstacles. And I had reached my tipping point. I was to the max for what I could handle emotionally. And I remember where I was because I was driving and I was so mad. I was mad at God. And I'm like, God, are you just messing with me today? What are you doing? And it happened to be a moment where he just spoke, not audibly, but in my spirit, and he just said this, I love you too much to leave you alone. Stuck with me the rest of my life. He loves you too much to leave you alone. He cares too much about your development and what he is doing in your life to ever leave you alone. Come to a father who gives you the security of being in the family. I've used this illustration before. Let's say that one of my sons or daughters comes and spits in my face. And you ask the question, are they still in the family? Well, the simple statement is, yes, of course they're in the family. But how is your fellowship at that moment? You would say, well, it's not very good. Well, do they need to ask you for forgiveness? Yeah, they need to ask for forgiveness. Do they need to ask for forgiveness to get back in the family? No. Rather, simply to make the relationship and the fellowship right. So here's the promise. Here's the security for everyone who is in Christ Jesus. It, it, it'll say this when we get to the, to the sixth spiritual blessing, that you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit that you are in the family, that when you are an adopted son or daughter by God Almighty, that is it. It is final. When he has declared you holy and blameless, that is it. It is final. You are in. There is a security that he is holding on to you. You are not holding on to him, and you are forevermore his child. Yes, you need to come to him and ask for forgiveness, but that is only to restore fellowship. That is only to, to mend broken relationship for sin. It is never to get back in the family. If you are in Christ, you are an adopted son or daughter. There's security in that. Come find a father who gives good gifts Oh, don't you love this passage out of Matthew 7, 11? It says, if you being evil love to give good things to your children. Pause right there. We love to give good gifts to our children, right? You know you do. I'm thinking of this most uh, recent Christmas time where uh, Lane and I and her mother got together, put our heads together, and we came up with this brilliant idea to make a, uh, a tree house at the mother-in-law's house in Ranger Creek. And we're in the process of building a tree house. We built the platform, and now me and the kids gather together, and, and we are actually building the house there. And I want you to know the amount of energy and time and excitement that we planned into just giving them the gifts, right? I mean, behind the scenes, you should have heard me and Lane and, and uh, Grandjill just talk about how 
how exciting this entire project's going to be. We were probably more excited than them. Why? Because a parent longs to give their children good gifts. How much more so your heavenly father? How much more so your heavenly father? Does he love to give you good gifts? Romans 8.32 argues like this. He who did not spare but gave you his own son, how will he not freely give you all things? He loves to give good gifts. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9. Come find a father who has given us his name. Revelation 3, 12. He who overcomes, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Ian was placed in our home at six days old. But his adoption did not become final until he was six months old. When Ian was born, he was given a different name. But at the time of his legal adoption, whenever he was six months old, there was issued a brand new birth certificate that is backdated, put on there his new name. Ian Josiah Smith. Now, his mother and I chose the name Ian. It's a derivative of John because it means God is gracious. And that last name, Smith, it may, mean, it may be the most common last name in the United States, but it sure means a lot to me to know that my son's name is Ian Josiah Smith because it means he's mine. He's mine. Now I'm out of time. There are many other blessings that you have because Christ, uh, because God is your father. But I need to recap these for you so that you can just kind of drink them from a fire hose so that you can understand. If you are in Christ, this is who you are. This is your father. Come to a father. He is tender and compassionate. He rejoices over you. He knows and understands you. He promises to provide and protect you. He promises to shape you with wisdom and discipline. He is a father who loves to give good gifts. He gives you the security of being in the family, and he has given you his name. Now, church, doesn't that make you want to shout? Doesn't that make you want to rejoice? Doesn't it make you want to overflow with a hallelujah? How good is our Father? Amen. So good. So now let me apply this to you. Church, I know that when you sin, you see, sin, inevitably, it separates your relationship with God the Father. And when you sin and you feel that separation in relationship, you say in your heart, in your mind, I don't feel like a, a son. I don't feel like a daughter. And it's at that very moment that the enemy begins to come and whisper into your ear, He's so angry with you. You are nothing more than a slave. And experientially in that moment in your feelings, you have reverted back to being a slave in your mind. And you think of your father no longer as a father, but rather 
an angry taskmaster. And the truth of the matter is, listen, we all do this. You hide in your sin. You hide in the shame and the guilt of your sin and you sit there and you feel the waves of guilt as they come and you say to yourself, where can I go? Listen to me. I don't care how you feel. I don't care how you feel in that moment. The truth of the matter is you are a son or a daughter if you are in Christ. How do you as a parent, I want you to think like a parent, how do you plead with your children? Do you not say to them, come to me. Come to me no matter what the circumstances. Come to me. And don't you mean it? How much more so, your heavenly father, how much more so does he just say, come. Come just as you are. Yes, I see that sin. But come. Jesus died for that. Come. Why do you hide? Why do you sit in the weight of your sin? Don't you know I sent my son for you? Come. Come to me just as you are. Come to me. Come broken. Come confused. Come happy. Come needy. He is not angry at you. Some of you need, me to hear, need to hear me say that. He is not angry at you. He's not angry. His wrath is diffused. He's not angry. Come. Just as you are. I want you to imagine the one person that you would give anything to spend just one more day with. Maybe they've already gone to heaven. Maybe they've moved away. Life has taken you in different directions. I want you to imagine the rejoicing at that moment of embrace. That is infantile in comparison to how much your heavenly Father desires you always. As you're listening to this sermon, who in your life needs to hear this? Who do you know that is still outside the house that is a slave and needs to hear the good news of what it's like to be in the house? Will you tell them? It's amazing the memories that linger over from childhood. Those things that kind of burn in your mind. From my parents' perspective, this next incident was, I'm sure that they never even thought of it, never even mattered much. But for me, I still remember it because it deeply shaped me. You see, I was in junior high and I was in trouble again for talking too much in class. And it was report card time, and written on this particular report card was how I had been argumentative with the teachers too much. And so my parents gave me a very stern talking to, as they were used to doing. But in this particular incident, my father waited for my mom to leave the room and when she did, he turned to me and he spoke to me no longer as a child, 
but he spoke to me differently this time. And he said, son, I understand. I understand your seemingly need to argue. I understand your need to lay out a logical argumentation. Son, I understand all of that because you're just like me. And in those words, something deep stirred within my soul. Because I knew I was known. I was a son. And my father knew me. And he understood the complications and everything that was going on in my heart. And he understood me. Come to a heavenly father who knows you, who sacrificed his son for your sin. And he says, come. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, God, I pray right now all across this room that you would be driving these truths deep into our soul. Your word says that it will not return to you void. And so, God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would allow us to drink deeply and to understand and come before you just as we are And to hear in the depth of our soul, you are my adopted son. You are my adopted daughter. God, would you do work that only you can do? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.